Hello, Y Church family. This fourth Sunday of Lent, we are going to hear a scripture reading from John 16, starting in verse 31, and Esther's going to read that for us. All right, I'm reading out of the Gospel of John, chapter 16, 31. Do you now believe, Jesus replied, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Thanks, Esther. Well, who would have thought what 2020 would hold? Who would have thought that I would be speaking to you via video from my basement because a virus is spreading across the world? This is uh, such a surreal experience. And I wish, I so wish that I could look you each in the eyes and, and be with you together uh, in worship at the, at the YMCA. But here we are. I asked my wife uh, if I needed to dress up for church this morning. And I, I don't know what you're wearing, but I hope that you are well and safe and snuggled in at home. I wonder this morning how many kids might still be in their pajamas. Actually, I wonder how many grown-ups are still in their pajamas. Uh, of course, we realize that not everyone is home. Some in our church family are working extra shifts at work. Uh, you are in health care or maybe in senior services in public service or government. You might be in, in, working in a grocery store or food services in semis in delivery trucks. And we are so grateful for those who are serving on the front lines of this crisis. Uh, we also think of all the educators who are rolling up their sleeves and figuring out how to teach remotely and how to encourage their students. Uh, these were tough days as classrooms were closed and many abrupt goodbyes had to be said. Our hearts are also with those from our church family whose businesses closed uh, or who lost their jobs this week. I know folks from our congregation who last Sunday, one week ago, had a job and then this week found themselves filing for unemployment. Now we want you to know that we're here for you in whatever ways we can and we're praying for you. On the church side of things, one Sunday ago we were still at the Y. We had one last worship service there, albeit with good social distancing practices. And there were many who joined last week as well via live stream. As church wrapped up, I just still remember seeing the gym uh, full of people who were lingering. It was like we all kind of knew that, that there was a whole lot of change uh, on its way and we might not get to be together for a while. And then it was uh, last Sunday night that the YMCA closed, closed to the public. And on Tuesday, then, our church staff team had one last meeting at the Y, uh, able to see some of our, our friends and YMCA staff and to pray with them. And then we packed everything up and walked out the doors. And so here we are. Uh, but the church, we know, is still the church, and our mission is not bound by a building, and Jesus is still sovereign. And that means that this that this whole situation is not spinning out of control and he has not lost you out of his sight and out of his care. Uh, we're in the season of Lent these days, these 40 days leading up to Easter. And we use this time each year to prepare our hearts and our minds to remember the death and resurrection of Jesus. This Lenten season, we've been focusing on the phrase, Jesus is. And then each week we've finished that phrase with a new word, a different word. So the first Sunday in Lent was March 1st. Everything still felt completely normal on March 1st, at least in our part of the world. And we gathered together and opened the word under the theme, Jesus is powerful. Uh, in week two, Megan led us into the theme, Jesus is humble. Uh, that was the weekend our men were up at Camp Shamanoff for men's retreat for the weekend. And the first rumblings of this crisis could be heard, it, kind of like the rumbles of a thunderstorm uh, that is on its way, but still off in the distance. And then last Sunday was the third Sunday of, of Lent, and in the midst of a rapidly changing situation, we studied Matthew 6, and we said, Jesus is peace. 
And now here we are, the fourth Sunday of Lent, and we're saying Jesus is the overcomer. That's our theme for today. Uh, the passage that we heard from, John 16, starting in verse 31, um, this passage is one I briefly mentioned last week, but now this week we're expanding it and getting to study it in detail. And I want to outline it for us in three main headings. We're going to talk this morning about belief, about being alone, and about the claim of Jesus to have overcome. And so as we turn towards Scripture, I encourage you to have that open in front of you. John 16, 31 is where we're starting. And Jesus here is speaking to his disciples. Now, he's been speaking to them for a few chapters at this point. Uh, this is a famous portion of, of the gospel, of John's gospel, called the Farewell Discourse. Jesus is heading toward the cross to give his life for us, and, and he gathers around his disciples for some last instruction and to say goodbye. And, and maybe this week you'll have a chance to read this whole section. Uh, it's John 14 through 17, the farewell discourse. And, and chapter 17 of that is a prayer that Jesus says. And so that makes these verses at the end of chapter 16, Jesus' last words of teaching to his disciples. And so it's kind of like the, the grand finale at the end of the 4th of July fireworks. This is the big finish. These are momentous words. And Jesus says in verse 31, Do you now believe? Do you now believe? And I wonder if you've ever noticed how, how much Jesus likes to ask questions. Why is that? You know, it, He's the Son of God, the one through whom all things were created, Scripture says, all-knowing, all-powerful, all all-wise, and yet he loves to ask questions. Uh, and some of those questions we see in the Gospels are like, who do you say I am? Do you want to get well? Why are you so afraid? Why did you doubt, Jesus asks. Uh, did, you, did you still not understand? Are you, also going, are you also going to leave? What does Scripture say? Who touched me? Do you love me? Why does he ask questions? I think it's not because he doesn't know the answer. It's because we need to know the answer. The big finale of Jesus' farewell to his disciples. And what does he say? He asks a question. Do you now believe? And this isn't the first time this question has come up. Uh, in Matthew 9, there's two blind men who come to Jesus to be healed. And what does he say to them? Matthew 9, 28, he says, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Another example, in John 11, Jesus is speaking to Martha, and that's where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Then what does he say? Do you believe this? It's John 11, 25 and 26. So there are so many questions right now that we can't answer. Uh, how long will this last? How bad will it get? Uh, will I get sick? Maybe you're wondering that. Uh, what will happen to our health care system? What will happen to the economy? What will happen to my job? What will happen to my family and friends? And we're re reminded in this kind of situation how little control over our life we actually have. There are so many questions we can't answer. But one question we can and that is the question, what do you believe? This kind of crisis brings that kind of question right to the top, doesn't it? What do you believe about God? Do, do I trust him? Uh, do I believe that he's, he's there? Do I, what do I believe about his character? What do I know from the Bible is true about who he is? What do you believe? I find it very interesting just thinking of the, the Bible verse of the year for 2020. Uh, this comes from the daily text, these readings that the Moravians have been publishing for almost 300 years now. And the verse selected as the Bible verse of the year for 2020 comes from a story in Mark 9, where we have a father who in a very desperate situation brings his boy to Jesus, his son. And, and Jesus says, says to the father, everything is possible for one who believes. And then what does the father say? This is the verse of the year, Mark 9, 24. He says, I do believe. Help my unbelief. 
And I want to tell you this morning that if you are wrestling with belief these days, if, if you're wrestling with these kinds of questions, then you're wrestling with the right thing. Now is the time to seek Jesus, to be honest and to seek clarity about what you really believe. Because what you really believe is what will carry you or collapse under you in the weight of this season. From there in the text, we move into the next section uh, that I've marked in my Bible next to verse 32, where Jesus says, A time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered each to your own home. Now that's striking, isn't it? I, I mean, here we are. We too have been scattered each to our own home. And yet we also remember the context of when this was first said to the disciples. Their scattering was under different circumstances. Again, we remember that Jesus was saying goodbye, uh, preparing for his betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion. And like it says in Zechariah 13, the sheep, uh, his disciples, would scatter and would leave their, their shepherd. And so Jesus says in our passage in John, you will leave me all alone. But then look at the assurance of his relationship with the Father. He says, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. And Jesus' relationship with the Father is really a picture of what our relationship with God is supposed to look like. And what I want you to see here then is the absolute assurance that you are not alone. Now, we could study this, this subject throughout the whole Bible, but I just want to give you three New Testament examples. We remember the words of, at the end of Matthew's gospel where Jesus commissions his disciples, and then he says in Matthew 28, 20, Behold, I am with you always. Always. That includes 2020. He says, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And of course, we step from the Gospels into the book of Acts and the gift of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity who indwells every believer in Christ. And that's why Jesus says in John 14, starting in verse, verse 17, He lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He does not leave you alone. And so all this leads Paul to conclude in Romans 8, just one last example, that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God. Paul says in Romans 8, 38, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, uh, that means not sickness, not isolation, not pandemic, not financial fallout, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are not alone. I've been so moved this week to see these stories of how people are showing their solidarity with one another, how people are, are showing others that uh, we're in this together, you're not alone. And so we've seen... Uh, Footage of Europeans applauding healthcare workers from their balconies and windows. We've seen the YMCA step up and open its doors to provide child care for essential workers. We've seen people grab their sewing machines at, and start making masks at home that can be delivered to hospitals. We've seen our local churches band together in prayer and in supporting our city. I was just on a video call on Wednesday with the other Elk River pastors. Uh, we've seen our, our church family connecting, even in this situation, um, on the phone, online, in all kinds of creative ways. Students on Google Hangouts, our leadership team on Zoom, Pastor Sonia was calling our, our seniors, our worship team figuring out how to, how to create video and be able to stream uh, worship to you. The situation has scattered us. It's isolated us physically, but people are showing each other you are not alone. And so if that's what we do on a human level, how much more does God show us that he has not left us alone? What are some of the ways he's shown us that? He sent his son to save lost and scattered sheep. He sent the Holy Spirit to be with us and in us and lead us. 
so that even if you are alone in your apartment right now or surrounded by people and overwhelmed by this situation, you can know that you're not alone, that God is with you, that he will never leave you nor forsake you, not in 2020 and not ever. Well, that brings us then to the third and final part of this text where we're saying Jesus has overcome. So we started with him asking if you believe, then he shows you that you're not alone, and now he tells you to take heart that he has overcome. Uh, and this is the last verse of this whole farewell, and, and this is one I really think you should put to memory. John 16, 33, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And that word for overcome, that's a special one. Uh, it's the Greek word nikao, which is where the company with the swoosh for a logo gets its name. Nike comes from the word nikao, and it means victory. Jesus is saying here, I have conquered the world. I've triumphed. I'm victorious over the world. Nike says, what's their, their slogan? Just do it. The Bible says, he did it. He did it. And with that, we know that the final chapter of the story is written. We know how this story finishes, that he wins. But in the meantime, uh, the Bible says too, we'll still have trouble in this world. Uh, the Bible scholars who, who write about this call it the already but not yet. So Jesus has already overcome, but the final resolution is not yet here. We're living in this in-between, this tension. And it reminded me of something from the world of music that I think we can illustrate. I'm sitting here next to my grandfather's piano. Let's see if I can show it to you. Uh, before my grandfather died of cancer, he gave me his piano. So it's been this um, very special thing to have in our house. And I remember first learning how to play the piano and, and being a little kid and playing the song Chopsticks. And I, I bet some of you know it and, and even know how to play it. Uh, if you know the song, then you know that it starts, it starts like this. Just like that. Uh, and, and really, when you think about it, how it starts is an, it's an ugly sound. In music, we call that dissonance. Dissonance is a lack of harmony. It's a clash of notes. And when we hear dissonance in music, it's like it's calling out to be resolved, to be fixed, and for the, for the notes to sound good again. And really, that's the whole song of Chopsticks is moving from dissonance in the beginning to that final note of resolution, that octave at the end. And so in life, what happens when you're stuck in dissonance, when, when you're stuck right here and you're crying out for things to be fixed, but it's not here yet? Isn't that the situation we feel like we're in? That the world is stuck crying out to be fixed right now. And we feel pretty helpless, and we long for things these, these days to be put back in order. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. In other words, you'll have dissonance. It'll get ugly. You'll get stuck, but take heart. And why? Because I have overcome the world. Writing about this passage, uh, D.A. Carson said, The decisive battle has been waged and won. The world continues its attacks, he says, but those who are in Christ share the victory he has won. I don't know exactly how you're feeling right now, uh, but I can guess. I mean, there's a lot of folks feeling afraid in these days, feeling alone. You might feel anxious or helpless. You might feel unsettled or worried or overwhelmed. And I want to remind us of the end of the story and, and, and just remind us of a place like Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, where an elder comes up to John and he says, John, weep no more. But behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome. He has done it. 
And because he has overcome, we overcome. We get to declare his victory over this virus. It does not get to do whatever it wants to do, but it is under the thumb of the one who is making all things new. And you and I get to carry his banner and to share his love with a world that is crying out for things to be fixed. We get to say right into the teeth of whatever comes that in all these things, it says in Romans, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So my brothers and sisters, let me close by asking if some of you might remember how we started this year. Uh, it was New Year's Sunday, coming into 2020. We were together for worship at the Y, and we looked at this little passage from the little book of Jude. Of course, having no idea what this year would hold. But we read these words together. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now, yes, in 2020, and forever. Here's how the rest of that song goes. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, would you help us these days to be decisive about what we believe? Would you assure each one who's listening, Lord, that you are with them, that they're not alone? And would you encourage our hearts with the good news of your victory that you have overcome? We praise you for that, Lord, and we thank you for that promise in your mighty name we pray. Amen.